Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. Chapter 5, and we'll read that in just a minute. I want to ask you uh, a couple of introductory questions here. Have you ever uh, experienced uh, some sort of humiliation like uh, you're, you're, you, when you were young, being picked for a sports team, especially if you're a man but, or boy, uh, but even girls, you feel that they're, they're picking sides and you're the last one to be chosen. You know, that's humiliating, isn't it? It feels awful like you don't measure up. Uh, you, someone wants to put a music group together and you say, I can play, and they go, uh, we'll call you, don't call us. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, the embarrassment is very real. And this applies to all of us. Have you ever been left out of a crowd? You're not cool enough, not smart enough, not good looking enough. You ever felt that? No one's bouncing their heads like you normally do, but I'm assuming that you have felt like that from time to time. What it does is it leaves a person feeling alone and rejected, and isolated. And oftentimes we can find ourselves in that place. And our text is a story of a man who found himself in that place. And that's why we're calling him the unpopular man out of the book of Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 27. It says, After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. What's the name of the tax collector? Yeah, he's also called Matthew in other places, in other places, okay? So Matthew and Levi, it's like, uh, and I know there's people here, you guys have like three or four names that are your name, you know, and so you could kind of pick one uh, to be your name. That's how this was. But in, in this text, his name is Levi. So it says, a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax collect tax office. So where was Levi sitting? The tax office, okay? The tax office. And he, Jesus, said to him, follow me. So Levi, sitting at the tax office, Jesus says something to him. What does he say to him? Follow me, okay? So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi, in verse 29, gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciple. The scribes and Pharisees were different sects of Jew, sects of Jewish, sex, sounds like sex. I'm not saying sex, I'm saying sects, S-E-C-T, of Jewish religion They were very religious people, very high-minded people, people who thought that they were better than others, people who were picked first from the team, people who were esteemed in society, people who looked good and acted good uh, and and had wealth and, and all of that. And so they looked down and complained against Jesus' disciples. They didn't like those who were following him. And they complained to them saying, why... Do you eat with and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Saying, hey, if you're really from God, like you say you are, if you're really something special, how come you're hanging out with these folks? What's going on here? This needs to tell us a little bit of something about Christianity. Christianity isn't about pomp and circumstance. It isn't about prestige and power. It's about God associating with those who are in need. It's about God coming down to those uh, who the world looks down their nose at. If you thought coming to Aspire Church or any church for that matter was going to somehow make you powerful in society, you're not following the same Jesus. Jesus answered and to, said to them, verse 31, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Hmm. 
Pray with me, would you? Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning, God, so grateful for your Holy Spirit and your word mingled together and infiltrating our hearts, asking today, God, for your divine blessing upon this message. You know what plans I had, but you know where we're at, and we're praying that your favor would just come forth. We're asking, God, that you would bless your people, help your people, encourage your people, those who are watching online, those who listen at a future date, and those, God, who are not here that should be here, God, bless them, help them, touch them. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity and give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. First thing we need to discuss as we're looking at Jesus and the unpopular man is this concept and this feeling and this condition uh, called rejection. Rejection. For Levi, rejection was a way of life. And we can tell that by what is written here in our text. He was seated in his little tax booth. And he was seated in a way, in a position, his tax booth was where fishermen would come by because he would extract tax from the fishermen. And they would be on their way to the market every day. And these fishermen were not easygoing kind of fishermen like we sometimes have in this country where they're part of a fishing club with a nice fishing rod and they have a nice chair and then a beautiful countryside it's not that kind of fishing it's fishing upon rough waters and these were rough men you might call them a salty kind of men and nonetheless though they still were required to pay tax to Rome after every catch and that was why he was in this strategic position Levi would have been well known to all the people in the area, and not for good reason. They would not have liked this guy. He was one of them, a Jew, but he was in service to Rome. They hated Rome. He was like someone who broke across a picket line or someone who was a a, a scab that would cross over uh, when the union had gone on strike, but they wanted work and they went and did it. That's the type of attitude that Levi had here he was certainly aware of Jesus because all of the flurry that had been going on through the countryside about Jesus and who is this guy and he's a miracle worker and look at his claims and look who his disciples are Levi would have been well versed in all this because he sat there all day long met all kinds of people observed a lot and he would have known what was going on And by our text here, we know that he was ingesting some of this in his heart. Never downplay your testimony. Never downplay your position. You may be at work and you may not be preaching at work, but they know you're a believer and they see how you live and it's, they're observing, they're watching. That's how Levi was. He was watching, seeing all that was going on. Now, Levi was, one of the reasons why he was paying attention to all of this was because He was a Jew, and he was knowledgeable in Scripture. He would have almost certainly been a student uh, of Scripture. And he was despised yet by all of the people, and despised having a career that was hated by both the Jews and the Romans. He was like in no man's land. You ever been there? Your friends on one side don't want you. Your friends on the other side don't want you. I remember first becoming a Christian. I lost all my worldly friends. They thought I became religious, a Jesus freak. But all the Christians were a little bit leery of me. For one, I was a different skin color than all the people in my church. The other thing was, is I was a little bit taller than everybody, so that made it a little bit different. And I was married to one of theirs, a Mexican. It was like, what's going on? So I didn't have a lot of friends here on either side, no man's land. That's kind of where Levi was. So as he saw this, though, and he watched Jesus, and he saw what was going on with his disciples here, little by little, his bitter, hardened heart began to soften, and he warmed to the message of Christ. How many know people eventually, over time, if they're open, warm to the message of Christ? With that being said, he still had this issue that we all, or a lot of us have, over time, is rejection, rejection, rejection. 
There's two kinds of rejection. There's one that we'll kind of call ingrained rejection. These are uh, rejection that comes, that's just in you. Uh, years ago, people used to call it a spirit of rejection. I'm not sure it's a spirit, but it, it, they call it that because it so invaded your heart and mind. These are people who had suffered at the hands of a serial abuser and never felt good enough. People who had been manipulated sometimes sadly, so sadly, by their own parents. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You've got to achieve. You've got to do better. It's ingrained rejection. Then there's circumstantial rejection. Ingrained rejection, now circumstantial rejection. And this is much, much more common. Some of you may be saying, well, man, I've got ingrained rejection. My parents were mean to me my whole life. Maybe not. Maybe that you don't have ingrained rejection. But a lot of us have experienced circumstances where you wanted something so bad and then you were rejected. Something you strived for and thought you were doing okay, but then was rejected. I read an article, you might have seen it, about a woman that uh, applied uh, to the uh, police force in Scotland. Wanted to be a part of the police, of, police force her Her entire young life, she unfortunately had been taking antidepressants. And so even though she was stellar in her uh, academics uh, in joining the police force, she was even at the point where they were fitting her for a uniform. Her final step was to do the medical exam. And they asked her about taking medicine. She said, well, of course, I've already told you everything. And they said, well, is it true that you're taking medicine? Uh, antidepressants and she said yes and there's a rule against that and so she was rejected from the her candidacy as a police officer devastated her some of you might be able to relate to something like that maybe there was a person you liked when you were young you liked them you fancied them you thought that they looked nice you wanted to get to know them better but they didn't like you and rejected you I remember when Gracie and I first were together we were first dating I was like so in fear of rejection I was younger than her and everybody knew it and they kind of made a deal about it even her own mother who became my own mother at one point so in love with her she's with the Lord now said hi man he too young for you he too young for you I thought that I was going to be rejected all the time from her because she, I was white and she wasn't and her race didn't like white people and white people were like rejected from her race and looked down upon white people and I thought, man, I've got to try to look as less white as possible and act less white as I can and did everything I could to not be white because of this fear of being rejected from this girl that I wanted. And you all can relate to some times when you felt embarrassed over being rejected. Levi was probably at that point in his life because he had a, a, a lifetime of rejection. I can't bring myself to go to him. I want to know more, but is he going to listen to me? I'm hated by his race. I'm hated by the, my employer's race. What can I do? Will he accept me? Do you have room for a tax collector in your band of disciples here? Sometimes we might feel like that. Does God have room for us in his plan? Can God use me? Does God want me? When you're going through some hard times and maybe the trials are very fiery and powerful, it's easy to think, does he even care about me? And all of your past rejections can come back to you and you can feel most likely how this publican, this tax collector named Levi felt. The other thing that we need to address as we look at this story of this unpopular man with Jesus is this idea of restoration. Why don't you say restoration? And I just want you to, if you forget everything else I say about restoration, try to get this. This is Jesus' specialty. He's an expert restorer. Some of you know about 
classic cars that are there in America. Pastor Jonathan uh, loves those old cars that are restored in California. And because of the weather, some of them can be quite old and still be in great shape. And there are, are companies and in particular individuals who their specialty is restoring these cars and getting them from where they're at to bringing them back to their original shine and their original glory. And I want to say to you that Jesus is much like that. It was so unique for Jesus to speak to a man like Levi. The idea that he would speak to him, much less call him as a disciple, was just like unheard of. And yet, Jesus takes this broken, rejected, hated individual and brings him on board and says, be part of Team Jesus. Be part of Team Jesus. <laughs> like the Samaritan woman that we've read about. We'll probably get to her in this Jesus and series. She was despised. So was Levi. Even if you're despised by man, even if you feel despised by God, I would like to tell you that Jesus specializes in restoring despised individuals. Hmm. And yet, when he sees Levi, he tells him, follow me. I think that's significant that even when Levi wasn't even really saying, hey, can we sit down, come, in, come into my tax office and, and let me query you about what your belief system is and people are saying this and that. None of that. It was just Jesus sees him, catches his eye, catches a little glimpse of him and sees something in Levi and says, follow me. I got to tell you today, man, you don't have to be a, a, a theologian to follow Jesus. You don't have to be someone who has it all together even. You can even have a pack of baggage of sins at this point. Eventually, Jesus will help you get rid of them. That's what happened to Levi. But at the initial point, man, he'll just take you as you are. Take you as you are. You don't know how many times I've wept before God saying, I'm not this man. And I would name someone's name. And I would say, I can't preach like this guy. And I would name his name. And I don't know how to uh, manage churches the way so-and-so knows how to manage churches. Frustrated so, so many times until God speaks to me and says, look it, man. You're you. I'm going to work through you the way I want to work through you. Man, I just felt like I'm not being rejected. I'm being restored. Sometimes we complicate the Christian issue just too much. Jesus is just a savior that wants to save. He's a discipler that wants to disciple. He can sanctify you, set you free, do all the things that are necessary if you'll just do what this man did. We don't need anything other than what Jesus prescribes. If you feel rejected, if you feel despised, if you feel on the outside looking in, I want to tell you the answer is not going to be found in a special book or a special prayer. Prayer and books are fine, but the answer is going to just be found by doing what Jesus says we need to do. It's pretty, pretty simple. I read through the Bible. I've read through the Bible numerous occasions, but I focus on the New Testament. I focus a lot on the Gospels because it's all about Jesus. We have a particular result that occurs when someone follows Jesus' prescription, and this is how you can tell if you're following his prescription. You now, you now have a desire to change your lifestyle to a lifestyle of obedience. If you have that desire in your heart, I want to obey the Lord, raise your hand right now if that's you. Okay, I'm not going to look at you because I don't want you to feel bad if you didn't raise your hand. Go ahead and put your hand down. But if that's your desire, you're on the road here. Jesus does not despise you. You might have had some failures along the road. I'd ask you to raise your hand, but I think some of you might lie and not raise your hand. We all have had failures, haven't we? 
But along that road, as long as we have that desire for a lifestyle of obedience, you can do it. After hearing those words, follow me, you know what Levi did? The Bible says he left it all to follow Jesus. And this is the prescription that we all need to see a change in our lives. And I want to ask you a simple but profound question today. Have you given all of yourself to Jesus? I know some of you have heard that over and over in your life, but it's a good question to ask yourself especially those who've been kind of like raised in and around Christianity. If your parents have been bringing you to church since you were a, a, a young person and, you, you know, there's this tendency to think, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. Well, you probably are a Christian, but that's not the question today. The question is, have you, like Levi, given all, left all, to be all in with Jesus my brothers and sisters that have been Christians for many years and know lots of things about church and Christianity, I ask you this question respectfully. Have you left all? Are you leaving all to follow him? Levi made this life-changing decision to give all of his sins, all of his heartaches, all of his pain, all of his rejection to Jesus He gave up his lucrative lifestyle to follow Jesus. I want you to see how all in he was. So here's another question that you can't answer right now that I do. You can start the process, but I want you to think about. And that's to take some time to think about your life and say, what is it that I need to leave in in order to follow Jesus more closely? Because as we carry on with Jesus for a while, we've been a Christian for a while, we tend to pick up things again, habits, attitudes, mindsets, you know, we could make a big list of things, but whatever it is, you've picked up, what is it that the Holy Spirit says to you, (laughs) that you need to leave? You say, but I'm used to it, it's no big deal, what about grace? Grace? I have grace. I'm saved by grace. Yeah, but I'm talking to you directly, God says. And I'm asking you now to follow me more fully, more closely. I want to say to some of you, you need to be in ministry or back in ministry. You need to be committed to ministry, church ministry, doing something in church, performing in church, being uh, functioning in church with a whole heart and a servant's heart and an attitude of commitment. There's a lot of reasons why you're not. And you might need to leave those, not might need, you need to. If the Lord's speaking to you, you need to. You need to. I've been talking with Gracie about this, how preachers sometimes inadvertently boast and try to boast about their life and kind of spin it to make them look good. So this next one's going to really sound like I'm trying to spin this to make myself look good. But I don't know anybody else who to illustrate this with, so I'm going to have to use me. And if you take it as a boast, that's your prerogative, but I'm not doing it to boast. 2015. Want to come to England? Come over. Be part of the Manchester Church. Manchester Church, the name at the time. I said, man, I've been 18 years in a church that's functioning and flowing. I've got lifestyle with grandkids, all these things. It was hard. Gracie was not for it. She was not for it. But the Holy Spirit said, what will you lay down for me? And it finally came to the point through, through a bit of agony, to be, be frank with you, To leave our lifestyle that was lucrative, we weren't rich by any means, but let me say to you, financially, it was a cut to come here. And we did that because it was the only, I I, I, I shouldn't say we, we both came together. I'm going to speak for myself. I did that. I did that because in order for me to continue following closely to Jesus, there were some things I had to leave behind. 
And I'm just using that as an example. It will not apply to 99.9% of you, but you can get the whole point that there's sometimes in your life you're at a place where the only way to go forward is for you to leave something there. It's a lifestyle, listen to this, of obedience. I know we know that word, but we often don't do it. His life, Levi's life, that was once defined by being lucrative and being snide and, and being uh, hated and despised. And you know, we, when you're in that uh, situation, you know, it started to hardening your heart. You become bitter, angry. Just give me the money. Just give me, I don't want to hear any of that. Just give me the money. Well, we can't really afford it. I don't care. This is the tax. Pay it. You become hardened when you don't follow Jesus. I want to tell you, Christian, you can get hardened if you don't follow Jesus fully. If you don't leave something behind that God is telling you to leave behind. His lifestyle, as I said, is now defined by obedience. Let me ask you a question. I'm asking a lot of questions today. How is your life defined right now? Not, not your past life, because some of you have been Christians a long time. You have a, a great pedigree. You, you have a, a, a legacy that you've started and continue on. You can point to that, and you should. No one's trying to take that away from you. But I'm asking you right now, if you want to be close to Jesus, what is defining you right now as a Christian? A lifestyle of obedience carries with it some components. Three big ones stand out. So you want to embark on this lifestyle of obedience. You're going to have to understand the first word, process. Process. Those two words, follow me, are important and significant. That word follow in the Greek means to literally walk along the same road as. So if I said follow me in the Greek using the same word, you would get with me and be on the road that I go. When I leave here on a Sunday, most Sundays, I travel a certain way back to my house usually. And we always go down that road. If you were going to follow me, you would have to go down that road with me, not your way to get to my place but you'd have to follow me on the road that I'm going. That's what Jesus was saying. I need you to be on my road, not your road. It's not to add too much um, overemphasis on theology here, but it's an imperative mode in the Greek, which means that it's not a suggestion or something that you can take and, and study. And It's an imperative mode. It's a command. So when he says, follow me, he's saying, this is a command. It's not an option. It's not, well, this might change your life and this might be good. It means, no, you you must. And I think sometimes we're disobedient because we forget that Jesus is saying, you must. I need you to do this. And if you don't do it, it's going to bring a real uh, division in our relationship. Some of you are far from God, not because you've been horribly bad, but because you have not been walking on the road that Jesus is on. It's also in the present tense, which also means that it's not something that's just done one time. It's not saying a prayer, oh, I'm on the road of Jesus. It's something that is habitual and continual. And this is what makes it a a bit more difficult. Loving Gracie, when I was 19 years old and for the first several years was not really hard at all. It kind of just came naturally. When we hit year 25 and year 30 and 35, uh, it became more of having to be intentional. I want to say to you today, your walk with God uh, is probably not going to be based on what you feel, but on what you make a decision to do. If that thing that I said a few moments ago about ministry resonates with you, you need to be in ministry. You need to have that commitment to the church and the people of God. It needs intentionality behind it. It needs commitment to behind it. It needs a, 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 it's not a, a, a casual thing. It's something you take seriously. This is what Levi was embarking upon when Jesus said, follow me. It wasn't like, 
hey, let's go for a walk. It wasn't that at all. It was a habitual continuation of this action. Follow and keep following. Don't stop following. Following now becomes what your life is all about. It's a process. But it also means if you're going to be on that lifestyle of obedience, it also means you're going to be a pupil, a student. (laughs) The original language could also be translated, not only follow me, but follow with me. It's not Jesus saying, walk behind me. It's Jesus saying, walk alongside me along the road. Now, we all know that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We know that he is God. We know that there is none like him. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. We can compare to him in no way, shape, or form. So when we say walk alongside him, it's not saying walk in equality with him. He's saying walk alongside me so I can teach you which was a common form of, of uh, disciple, uh, discipler and master-disciple relationship. I'll teach you along the road. It was a way that Deuteronomy speaks that you should teach your children, not by sitting them down and schooling them, but uh, walking alongside you in life. I taught my kids mostly about God in our cars and in our vehicles And while we had breakfast and ate a hamburger at McDonald's, that's when a lot of the teaching took place. They were with us when we went to church. They were with us when we went places. We took them to outreach. We took them to prayer meetings. We sat them down from Josiah's age uh, uh, right next to us as we prayed and sought the Lord. We made sure when they were in church that we gave them offerings so at the proper time that they could give offering and we tried to give them something substantial so that they would see that we're not just giving our little bit but we're giving from our hearts. (laughs) Sometimes they look at it like, I know they were thinking about pocketing it. I know they were. But they saw their parents doing that. That's what Jesus is saying here. I want you to be like that. I want you to be with me every day. Every day with Jesus, man. Don't stop. Stay with me. Walk alongside me. Be my student. Desire what I desire. Want what I want. See things from my perspective. Because that's our problem, isn't it? We see things from our own perspective. My prayer all the time is, God, I'm clouding this up. I'm clouding this up with my thinking, with my mindset. I need to see it from your mindset. This situation has me frustrated beyond belief. I'm, I'm tied in knots over this uh, uh, thing that has occurred, and I, I know I must be doing it wrong. Let me see what you see. That's a, that, that, that needs to be a continual prayer because it's so, so very hard. But yet that's what's required of those who walk with Jesus, right? Follow me, walk beside me, alongside me. A disciple, a follower, comes to be taught, not as a student, like listening to a lecture. Have you ever seen people, well, some of, many of you are university educated, you know, people in those classes, they're bored out of their skull, They're just randomly typing. They're listening, and um, they don't care. That's not this kind of student. This is a student that is drinking in the words that are being spoken. Preacher, preach to me because I want to learn. If you have to repeat it to me, repeat it to me. I'll ask you questions because I need to know this. Uh, I want to know about that. If you can't figure it out through man, you're praying on that thing. You're saying, God, uh, enlighten the Holy Spirit to me. Uh, Holy Spirit, enlighten me to your word. I would really ask that you would pray for every service that we have that God would visit us and that he would speak, not just for my benefit. Don't just pray, hey, let Pastor Tom have a good message today. Pray, Lord, use that man. Use that man the way you see fit. And let us all be open to receive from you as we walk alongside you as a pupil. It's a process. It's a pupil 
but it's also a partnership. I never want to take away from the deity of God and the deity of Jesus and the fact that he's in charge. He's the Lord. He's, 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 he's number one. He rules over everything. But Jesus was not some sort of teacher down at the local rabbinical school, you know. He wasn't just another rabbi that came on the scene that, well, we've got Rabbi so-and-so, now we have Rabbi Jesus, and, you know, he was just one of the, the many. No, it wasn't like that at all. He didn't have any kind of position at the synagogue. As a matter of fact, when he taught in the synagogue, they were kind of like ticked off at him. I've had people get upset at the way I preach, and some of that's just because I'm annoying and I'm abrasive, <laughs> but sometimes it's that they just don't like what I'm saying. You know, Jesus was not the kind to sit people down and talk. He was constantly on the move. Read your Gospels. He was going here and he was going there. Uh, just the minute you think that he's settling down, uh, he's up praying uh, and then saying, okay, I prayed, time to go. He's moving. He's moving. And I want to tell you today, he's not so much moving geographically like he did when he walked the earth, but he is moving spiritually. He is taking you and I and all of his people from one place to another. He's trying to take you from where you were to where he wants you to be. I know that might be and probably is different for each and every one of us. But let us not think that that's only for the super spiritual or the pastors or the leaders or the heavily committed. I want to tell you, my young brother and young sister, that maybe don't understand fully what God has for you. He's on the move in your life. And he's trying to take you from one place to another. The question is, are you walking with him? Are you in partnership with him? Jesus is saying to Levi, you know, I want you to follow me so we can be partners. So we can be partners. I want to be involved in every aspect of your life. I don't want to just be your savior. I don't want to just take you from your rejection so you don't no longer feel pain and we give you a position in life. It's not doing that at all. He's saying, I want to be involved in every aspect. You know, and I want to say to you today, sometimes we keep Jesus at arm's distance as Christians, right? We don't always involve him in every aspect of your life. He wants to be involved in your work in your education, not just the things you want, but things beyond what you want. I'm not saying he doesn't care about your desires. Absolutely he does. But at the same time, he wants to be part of that and exclude him from that. My mother, I was visiting my mother this last time. We, we, we went down to see her, had a little mini family reunion there for a little bit. And she was reminding me that when I was a kid, playing basketball on a team that there was another kid whose mom came and watched him out for a practice. We were out there playing and this mom was off to the side and we were like, whose mom's that, man? What's she doing here? We don't want your mom. And uh, 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 finally one nerdy kid said, it's my mom, you know. And I remember I didn't remember, my mom reminded me that I told her, if you ever show up at one of my games, I'll disown you. Because I didn't want her part of my life, man. I'm too cool for that. I'm a basketball, I'm a baller, you know. We didn't call it that back then, but I'm all that, you know. I don't want you there. She just wanted to be part of my world, you know. Every mom does, right? Jesus just wants to be part of your world. He wants to show up at your games. He wants to be part of your home life, be part of all the things that you do. Will you let him in? Will you let him in? Will you let him teach you some things? Teach you some things about how you do social media. Show you some things about what he wants you to view and listen to, where he wants you to be. He's not a mean God. He's a good God. He saved Levi, a rejected, despised, hated individual. He said, I want you to be part of my life and I want to be part of yours. And that's good news for us today. Jesus touched this unpopular man. Maybe you're 
an unpopular person here today. You, you, you might be, you know, smooth as silk here. You might be the cool breeze of the whole neighborhood. I don't know. You might be the finest of fine. You may be the best looking person on your block. You might be the, the, the slimmest girl or the uh, hunkiest guy at your job. I don't know. But you might not be. But whatever you are, Jesus wants to connect with you. Not based on your popularity, not based on what you have, but based on the fact that he loves you, cares about you. And that should be the blueprint for how we treat people as well. Same way. One thing to always remember about Levi is that later on, after he was a disciple, as I said at the beginning, his name was Matthew, one of the 12 disciples. This is the guy that penned the gospel of Matthew. Same guy, unpopular man, rejected and despised. God had great things for him. I know God wanted to bless Lillian and Marianne their baby. I know that. But I also believe this because I was one of the ones praying, so were many of you praying that this would happen for them. But I believe God has a plan for Josiah. And not just him, other kids in our church. Maybe I don't know their names or don't know everything about them. I'm just using them as an example. Sometimes the blessing that's come your way is because God has a plan to do something when you intertwine your whole life with him. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do count it such an undeserved privilege. It is an honor that we have not earned to be called a disciple. You have plans for us, and we admit that sometimes we have run from your plan. We have sidestepped your will. We have grown weary and well-doing, and from time to time we picked up things that today we want to leave so that we can become closer to you. As individuals, God, help us to identify those things that we need to leave behind. Help us to be honest with how we're being identified with our life, how it's being defined now. Let us be honest with how it looks and change that to a lifestyle of obedience. We're praying this, praying and pleading this would take place. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. It's doing that work. Touch each individual. Help me to just get out of the way now and allow you to do that great work. In Jesus' name. So our heads are bowed. Maybe there's one, two more that need Jesus as Lord and Savior. I hope you're gathered by coming to church here and maybe even just by this message today that being a Christian isn't about joining a church or religion or just church attendance. It's about you and your heart before the Lord, how you respond, how you choose to live, the decisions you make, the follow-through that you do. That's what matters. And if you don't have that type of relationship with him, we can rectify that today. There's no shame in admitting you need Jesus. There's no guilt that should be associated with your past if you're bringing it all to the foot of the cross. You can bring all your shame and guilt and give it to him, and he'll receive you just like he received Levi. And if that's you today, why don't you raise your hand? Raise your hand if that's you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Brothers and sisters, as we move on today, we see your hand. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask you, brothers, and sisters, we're not brothers and sisters because we're part of the human race. There is the brotherhood of the human race, but I call you brother and sister because we have the same Lord and Savior, Jesus. We're part of the family of God, so you're my brother, and I'm your brother. You're my sister, and I'm your brother. 
And brothers and sisters, I want to ask you today, what is your lifestyle like? Are you in the process of following, leaving all? Are you a pupil that walks alongside him? Are you in partnership, invited him to every area of your life? If that's some things that you need or there are some things that you need to change in your life, that's what church is for. That's one of the reasons why we gather, so we can alter our life. We call this front part of the church the altar, A-L-T-A-R. But we also wanted to alter, A-L-T-E-R, your life. Because when you encounter Jesus, you change from Levi to Matthew. God is speaking to you today as a brother and sister in Christ. You say, man, I, I need that lifestyle of obedience. I need to work on that. Would you raise your hand? Raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you here. Somebody else, you'd say, yep, that's me. I need to pursue that. Don't let pride. God bless you right here. I, I, I'm purposely wanting you to do that publicly because, you know, pride gets in the way. Spiritual pride gets in the way. What will they think of me? I'm, I, I'm this, I'm that. I'm going to tell you something. I'm a pastor, man. I have to repent all the time. I, 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 I admit that I have issues that I'm working through and I come before the Lord all the time with saying changes. Sometimes I have to do that publicly before people. And then I have a a position that most people don't think that that's uh, appropriate. But I want to say to you, if I do it, so should you. We should all do it together. So what I'd like for us to do is all stand to our feet today. If you raised your hand, I want you to come on up to the front. Come on up to the front if you raise your hand. If you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, come on up to the front. That's okay. You want to pursue this lifestyle of obedience we're talking about today. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. You can kneel and pray if you want, or you can stand. It's, it's entirely up to you. Sometimes we worry because we wonder, what is God going to ask of me? What is he going to ask of me? We think he's going to ask us to do things that we can't do. But I want to tell you, he won't ask you to do something you cannot do. And things that are beyond what you think you can do, but he wants you to do, he'll empower you to do. And he'll help you. I want to just thank everyone that's up here today because you're showing you want, it, you want this. You want this. Maybe you suffered a life of rejection and that's been hindering you. Come on up to the front so you can get that so starting to work in healing in your life. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's pray today. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Praise God. Gracie, can you help me pray, please? Heavenly Father, we do come before you today. Thankful, Lord, for these honest hearts that are bringing their hearts before you, bringing their hurts, their pains, their rejection, uh, admitting areas of disobedience and wanting to embark on a lifestyle of conformity to your word. They want to walk with you, Lord God. They want to be your pupil, They want you to be a partner in their life. They want to open up areas of their life that they've kept secret and hidden from you. And Lord, some of them are coming back repeatedly because they've done this before, but today they mean it and they're honest and you know their heart and be with them, oh God. Be with them. We pray together. We partner together as brothers and sisters that you would do a great work in our lives, Lord. Bring blessing, bring favor, bring encouragement, uh, bring understanding, God. Uh, Move upon lives. Uh, Help us to pursue the things of God. Help us, Lord, to understand uh, that you reached out to Levi and you're reaching out to us today. Lord, bring blessing today. Bring help today. Bring favor, Lord God. Miraculous power from above, In the name of Jesus, wisdom and guidance, Lord God, beyond religiosity to the place, God, of discipleship, of following, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, blessing and favor and encouragement, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, my God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Let's give Jesus a clap offering of praise.
Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you, or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk. We meet in different locations throughout the week, and if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you visit us. You can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk. Or if you'd like further information, find us on Facebook, look us up on Twitter. We also live stream all of our services, and once again, if you'd like to view online, you can find all the details on our website. Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.